bringing our beef consultants on to these operations, um, evaluating the feedstuffs that are there and using our beef specific ration balancing software uh, to help with balancing the diets and also giving some indications of projections and the important metrics that we use in the beef industry, things like cost of gain, uh, feed conversion, average daily gain, the things that we talk about every day in the beef industry that are important to our profitability that maybe isn't so on the minds of a dairy producer because they use different metrics. Hello and welcome to the Dairy Podcast Show. Uh, This is Mark Thomas, one of your hosts from Dairy Health and Management Services. And it's a pleasure today to have with us Dr. Amy Hoffla. She comes with us uh, from Cargill. She's the innovation lead for beef. Uh, We had some time to catch up here this morning before the recording. And uh, uh, Amy, uh, welcome to the Dairy Podcast Show. Thank you. Yeah, good morning. Uh, so, uh, if you could just take a, a few minutes and, and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, uh, you're from Montana, uh, now living in Des Moines, so a little bit of a change change there. Uh, but uh, a little bit about your your education background and, and how uh, you came to uh, work with Cargill and, and your current role of uh, innovation lead for beef. Sure. Yeah. Um, I've always been involved in the beef industry. I grew up on a ranch in eastern Montana. We raised commercial uh, commercial feeder calves and grew cereal crops. Uh, I went to school at Montana State University uh, for both my bachelor's and my master's degree and went on to Texas A&M for my PhD. I got to work uh, for a couple of years at USDA, the Ag Research Service in uh, State College uh, or College State College, Pennsylvania, uh, near where Penn State is, uh, doing some grazing research with dairy cows. Uh, Prior to coming and working at Cargill as the beef innovation lead, I worked for a nutrition company for about seven years as a beef cattle nutritionist. So got to see a lot of different uh, feeding systems all over the United States and in Ireland and England. And currently, as you mentioned, I work for Cargill Animal Nutrition. I'm the beef cattle innovation lead. So I support our innovation pipeline and support the development of new products, services, and solutions for our beef cattle uh, customers and our consultants at Cargill. Maximize profitability and herd health with early detection in animal health, reproduction, calving, and feeding. The most advanced bolus technology and professional support from agricultural experts makes this possible. SmaxTech, the health system that future-proofs your operation. Well, that's great, Amy. Certainly a varied background from uh, Montana to, to to State College, Pennsylvania. So lots of different, uh, not only geography and, 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 and crops, but uh, management styles and, and, and different types of beef operations. Um, so uh, day-to-day, uh, what does uh, your role bring you to as innovation lead uh, within Cargill? Sure. Yeah. No day is the same, which is awesome. That's what I like about it. So uh, any day I'm working on new projects or products anywhere from the ideation phase in the very beginning, things that are many years out, uh, to rolling out new products and services that are currently completed and ready to go. Um, And then it's helping support the research that goes into those products and services and uh, working with stakeholders and our consultants, interacting with customers to understand their desirabilities. Excellent. And there's probably some listeners wondering why on the Dairy Podcast Show we have the Beef Innovation Lead, but I think, you know, for most people, we think one of two things, obviously um, dairy beef, Okay, previously, and, and we, there still are bull calves, but but dairy beef, which has become um, very uh, adopted protocol. But also, I think most people say, you know, every good dairy cow hopefully becomes beef, right? If she if she's led her life, she mm-hmm. she leaves leaves the farm in the form of a, a consumable item. Um, and obviously, that's that's something that us in the dairy industry um, need to 
focus on continued to make sure that uh, you know the beef pipeline has good quality market cows um, that can enter and and you know all of the transportation welfare and and, and so forth related to that so uh, certainly uh, welcome to the show as the beef innovation lead um, so along those lines um, can you give us some of the examples of, of within your role where you see that collaboration with the the dairy industry and, and dairy producers Sure. Yeah. I think the collaboration among the beef industry and the dairy industry is really imperative to this, this particular topic. Um, with w- some of the things we're doing here at Cargill, we, we believe we can serve our customers better by taking a cooperative approach when advising and feeding these type of animals. Um, our dairy consultants are on the dairy farms available for advising on you know, the lactating cows and the heifers, but now our beef consultants are available to work alongside our dairy consultants. And they really bring with them the tools and expertise from the beef industry, from the cattle feeding industry to feed those cattle for profit. And that's great to hear, Amy, because as we discussed a little bit before we we, uh, connected here, um, is that, you know, in many cases, we see our producers that are raising uh, dairy beef um, either to a, a very great extent or, you know, here and there, raising some of those beef animals um, either as a business or uh, for some home and employee consumption. And and obviously, they, they are a different critter. They, they need to be fed differently. Mm-hmm. And in some of these cases, you know, we, we see maybe uh, being fed refusals or, you know, a ration that's not necessarily balanced for that animal or those stages of growth. So, can you comment a bit how, uh, sounds like a, gr- a great opportunity of collaboration, but how is your team um, integrating the that? Yeah, sure. Um, bringing our beef consultants onto these operations, um, evaluating the feedstuffs that are there and using our beef specific ration balancing software uh, to help with balancing the diets and also giving some indications of projections and the important metrics that we use in the beef industry, things like cost of gain, uh, feed conversion, average daily gain, the things that we talk about every day in the beef industry that are important to our profitability that maybe isn't so on the minds of a dairy producer because they use different metrics. Um, And then also advising on some of the everyday SOPs and management strategies that are specific to beef cattle, uh, stepping up diets, you know, increasing your energy density in your diets, implant protocols, although we try to let the veterinarians help advise on that more so than the nutritionists um, and, that, and that sort of thing. No, that's excellent. And I think you've, you know, highlighted some areas there that, um, you know, sure they're a, a, a calf, if you will, or or steer, or, or uh, uh, but they, they are, you know, a crossbred, a, 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 a different uh, cross, and, and therefore re- being raised for beef obviously requires different requirements, different feeding strategies, and you mentioned the implant strategies, uh, you know, something that in dairy, um, most dairy producers have never even thought about or, or sometimes don't consider. So those are all some really great opportunities. Um, I think as as also this um, the protocols of using dairy beef um, increase. Obviously, there's there's just more opportunity uh, for this. Uh, in terms of the uh, the marketing, are you, are you working at all with these producers? In terms of you said feeding for profit. Certainly, I would imagine uh, at times there's the recommendation of you know, you actually shouldn't feed these animals. You'd mm-hmm. be better off, you know, sending them early because either facility-wise, feed-base-wise, forage-wise, you you don't have the best conditions and actually you think maybe you're saving money, but mm-hmm. you'd be better off sending them off to a custom feeder. Yeah, that's a, that's a huge part of it, um, being able to advise – according to a farm's capabilities, their facilities, their labor circumstances, the feedstuffs they have available, what marketing strategy works best for those animals to be most profitable? You can sell them at day-olds. Day-olds are 
quite profitable right now in general. Yeah, very much so. <laughs> <laughs> it's wild. Um, you can feed them to, you know, to, to feeder calf stage. You can feed them all the way to finish. You could potentially retain ownership and send them to a feed, feed yard you select to work with. Um, there's a lot of different options and we do have the tools to help it, put in some of your inputs and really make decisions based around your inputs, your feeds, and so on, and your animals to help help make sure you make a profitable decision. That's great because, yeah, again, perhaps the best decision is is to send as a day old and uh, not mm-hmm. stress the the, the current uh, facilities. Perhaps you know how, how good of a job is that dairy doing with their own calves? Maybe they really need to focus on their dairy replacements. Um, as opposed to having this, you know, distraction, or maybe they have the the means and uh, facilities to to actually do a great job on on the the dairy beef side. So, uh, Amy, as innovation lead, um, what are some other innovations, um, either just in beef or some that maybe would be a, a product or, or strategy that could cross over into dairy also that you're you're working on. Sure. Uh, we will be releasing, or we have started releasing, um, a fly control bolus uh, that contains altisoid uh, through a agreement that we have with Central Life Sciences. So this fly control bolus um, is applied to the animal and helps control flies for up to 195 days. Um, we've talked with um, our dairy team about the potential to use that in heifers. And we will be doing an official rollout of that at NCBA at the end of February. Oh, excellent. So that's mm-hmm. a sustained release bolus then that would be a, a insect growth regulator in the in the manure? Correct. Excellent. Uh, and again, it's always, um, it, you mentioned more collaboration between dairy and beef. I think um, that opportunity uh, we know one, one event which I uh, am really involved with is the American Association of Bovine Practitioners (ABP), but we're a, a bovine veterinarian group, mm-hmm. and uh, you know there's a really strong beef program and a really strong dairy program, and I'm always interested. Um, many times I find myself in one of the the beef talks, and I see beef uh, veterinarians in the dairy talks, and I that's great to see because you know for a lot of meetings. Um, you don't get that opportunity. It's a beef meeting or a dairy meeting, so <laughs> you don't get that crossover. Um, uh, I think a great example of that, you mentioned NCBA when I was president of ABP. Uh, one of our roles is attending NCBA and um, probably wouldn't have gotten to that meeting. Uh, that's super impressive if I wasn't in that role. But again, lots of relevant uh, discussions, talks that, that – uh, are related to animal ag animal industry and and you know raising cattle so um i think that continued collaboration is 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 really important within your role day to day um where do you see some of the future opportunities in terms of uh continued collaboration with dairy um and beef and and uh, not only the the beef on dairy uh I guess if you look back, you know, quite a number of years ago, we, we probably wouldn't have thought of the market that's been created with, with beef on dairy. Internationally, there's still lots of opportunities. I think most of the mm-hmm. listeners know I live in uh, Mexico and uh, certainly there's uh, adoption of beef on dairy, but not to the extent that we've seen in, in the U.S. So uh, in terms of international or within the U.S., what do you think some of the future collaborative opportunities there are between the, the the two industries. Sure. I think one of the things that everybody talks about that we would really love to see, but is a challenge to to curate is a you know a total supply chain connection between especially with these beef on dairy calves. They offer some traceability, ease of traceability that we maybe don't see in the beef world. Um, can we follow them all the way through the system? what level of sustainability are they offering versus a straight Holstein calf, um, those sort of things and following it all the way up through the supply chain. Um, nobody's really done that yet. Um, it's a challenging thing to do, but I think that that's definitely something everybody's talking about. 
Well, that sounds like a great opportunity because as as we start to work with more groups that um, you know milk producers specifically uh, looking at that supply chain, you know, from the inputs to the dairy to their end product, um, certainly. I think, as I think about it, there hasn't been a lot of mention of the, of the, uh, you know, non-replacement calf within that model. So I think that's a really important aspect of what is the uh, carbon footprint of that uh-huh. byproduct to dairy, which actually uh, could be more efficient in the form of a dairy beef animal, or more efficient in the form of a. a over over raising replacement heifers right because now if if you have one more replacement heifer that you raise and don't keep that animal in in production she ends up being marketed uh i would imagine that has a very large carbon footprint in terms of mm-hmm. raising beef out of a female holstein as compared to a beef on dairy animal so i think that's a really good really good point there of how we need to capture those animals and that entire supply chain and, and, and carbon footprint. Are you aware of any specific work that that's that's looked at that specifically or or is that still something that that's that's needed? I think it's still something that's needed. Yep. It's um not an easy ask to really follow all of that and so still still something we need to evaluate okay. so um it's certainly interesting that you you spent some time in the, in the east and uh i guess as you um you know having born and raised in 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 the west uh you know beef country obviously now in the in the corn belt but uh time in the in the east what do you see some of the strategies that uh uh are implemented in terms of uh, uh, raising and, 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 and production uh, that, that are very varied, but could be adopted in other areas. Obviously, there's climate differences and so forth, but you tend not to think of Pennsylvania as a beef state, um, more of a dairy state. So, um, you know, what were some of your experiences while there? Yeah, I loved my time in Pennsylvania. It was beautiful. Um, our feed stuffs and our feed availability really varies um, from Montana to the to the Corn Belt to to Pennsylvania. You know, here where I live now, we have typically more feed than we know what to do with sometimes, um, and it's not that way out west. Uh, getting into Pennsylvania, the consumer base potential is different as well. You mentioned people feeding animals for maybe direct sale to consumers, and that I think tends to be a lot maybe not easier but a lot more possible in places where there's that population um and people who are willing to buy direct sale beef so those animals can can go to that maybe a little bit easier than we would have had our ability to do in in montana for example um so that's one thing i would like to see um the industry move more towards being sure that they use the feeding related technologies, um, the adoption of implants, the adoption of making sure you're using an ionophore to feed these type of animals. Um, that's typically thought as more of a technologies that are used on larger operations, but our smaller producers can benefit from those things as well. That's probably a good point. You know, again, on the, on the smaller scale or even by region where, um, you know, nutritionist veterinarians in the West would, um, you know, maybe I'm generalizing, but potentially w- would work with more large scale, both beef and dairy, or have that background given the region. Whereas then in, in places, you know, having come come from uh, working in, in Northern New York, you know, very small beef industry, the, the just the discussion, even availability of uh, product implants and those type uh, feed additives is just less common, right? So you wouldn't mm-hmm. ne- necessarily have easy access or as easy access to those technologies. So I think in the in the uh, innovation program that you're working with, this collaboration beef beef with dairy and, and Cargill, that's 
that's you know a great example or opportunity for those smaller producers that still have a impact in the total market volume but to give them access to some of these tools that maybe they they're just not aware of at all yeah and some of those tools are going to really allow them to be more profitable than they maybe otherwise would have been we know that implants are one of the most proven you know best proven ROIs in feeding cattle that applies to the smaller producers as well as long as you have the facilities to apply those type of technologies and and you bring up a great comment about you know the freezer beef having come from you know northern new york very rural area but still um and especially during and post pandemic uh you know families that want to buy a, a half or or, or, or even a whole for larger families of, of beef and that marketing ability because, uh, you know, that can certainly be uh, quite a profit center for a, a, a dairy who can raise those animals uh, efficiently, like you said, feeding for profit and then marketing those animals as such. So, you know, uh, have you... Um, has Cargill worked in that area at all specifically, you know, freezer beef with some of the um, customers? No, that doesn't tend to be our focus. I wonder for some of the, the you know, uh, dairy producers, if, if that's something that uh, could become a, a, you know, local market, especially if there's a dairy that's closer to a more urban area. Amy, uh, you mentioned NCBA. Um, great meeting. Uh, super impressive um, when I've attended, uh, you know, just the, the number of attendees, the programs, the discussions, the networking, um, I guess that's coming up kind of around the corner here in, in February. Uh, what, what is what is your role in, the, in, in that uh, meeting? And, and uh, do you have some presentations or, or um, I know Cargill will have presence there. How are you gearing up for NCBA? Yeah, so I was wrong about the dates. It's technically end of January, I think. I always January, kind I think. of forget. <laughs> yeah, it's always cold. <laughs> it's always a good time to leave the Midwest. Um, yeah, no, we have a great presence there. I do not have any presentations, but we do typically have um, one of our technical team members, uh, Dusty Abney, often does a presentation there. I'm not sure if he's scheduled to this year, but he did last year. Um, we have our booth and then we go there for interactions with our suppliers, interactions with our customers. And like I said, we'll be rolling out um, our fly control bolus um, at that meeting as well. Oh, excellent. Okay. So that's, uh, you, yeah, you did mention that you'll be rolling out that, that bolus. Well, that sounds like a, a great opportunity to uh, you know, present some of your, your ongoing initiatives. Amy, uh, any other thoughts or, uh, or comments around innovation as we, uh, as we wrap up a bit of our discussion here? Sure, yeah. Our collaboration among our beef and dairy teams at Cargill here to help support our customers feed these animals, is, it's, it's the beginning stages of this project. It's sort of our first go. We will continue to look at innovative ways to help feed these animals and make them profitable. There's a lot of unanswered questions surrounding these animals. Liver abscesses come up a lot, general um, productivity, red meat yield, a lot of things that probably have some sort of nutritional root and we are a nutrition based company. So we will continue investigating those things and, and innovating and seeing what we can, what we can do to, to support our, our customers along those lines. You, you certainly, you bring up liver abscesses and, um, you know, that's certainly, as we know in the industry, uh, you know, something we certainly need to focus on. Uh, and again, I would say most, most dairy producers raising beef, that's not something probably most even think about or are very knowledgeable about. Would you agree? Yeah. Uh, often if those calves leave the farm at a day old, the dairy producer will never have any idea what happens to the liver of that animal by the time it maybe gets to uh, the packer. So yeah, there's a, there's a gap there. Um, it's, it's a complicated topic. I think, as you probably know, we don't exactly know everything there is to know about what causes these animals to have a higher propensity of liver abscesses compared to like a native beef steer, for example. Um, is it the system itself probably plays some into it? 
just the dairy origin and and the the moving around of the animals and the then the early life management uh, circumstances or is it is the long days on feed is they are on higher concentrate feed for very long is it probably both of those things um, so yeah there's a lot to look at there yeah certainly lots of opportunity for continued research and and um, you know even product development within that uh, you know multifactorial right the uh, from from birth to feeding strategies, management strategies, and, and then the opportunity to use you know some feed additives. Well, Amy, thanks for for the discussion and your insight. Adaseo, a global leader in nutritional solutions and the provider of Smartamine N, the best in class rumen protected methionine product for dairy producers who want to optimize milk production, capture more value from their components, and maintain their lifetime performance of their herds. For more product information and to calculate your return on investment when you balance your feed with amino acids, go to MilkPay.com. It's time for our famous three. When your goal is to help animals reach their full potential, health matters. Diamond V offers a fresh perspective on animal health, a perspective that supports gut health, strengthens immunity, and ultimately enhances performance. For those who choose to invest in keeping healthy animals healthy, Feeding Diamond V makes a statement about another dimension of profit, where margins are measured by confidence in your future. To get a fresh perspective, visit diamondv.com, because animal health deserves a healthier approach. Here on the Dairy Podcast Show, uh, there's a, a few questions we'd like to wrap up with. Um, one is, uh, in, in terms of... For you, the beef industry, is there a reference that can be a book, a, a website, a uh, even a podcast series, I guess, um, that you look to as a, as a reference, uh, you know, either a professional publication, lay publication, but something that keeps you up to date and you feel is, is, is relevant. And I think given you're from the beef side, I would, I would say add into that, do you, is there a publication that would be valuable for a, a dairy nutritionist, dairy industry professional, dairy producer. Uh, for many years, I used to get beef today. Um, I did have a small herd of my own of beef cattle, but uh, uh, yeah, what, again, in, in keeping that collaboration in mind, what, what are some references that you go to, but also maybe a recommendation for a, a dairy industry person to uh, pick up and read now and again? Yeah, so that's good. Um, I think one of our more common questions on the from dairy producers who are raising their own animals to market for for fed cattle surrounds the economics of it and the marketing. Cattle Facts is a really good resource yeah. Yeah. for uh, prices, inventories, that sort of thing. I get their. I think they have a weekly or a every couple day mailer they send out to your email that you can sign up for. Um, yeah. And I read that a lot. That's a good one. In the Midwest, it seem, it feels Midwest-based, but Feedlot Magazine is a good uh, resource um, for feedlot-based things. So I really enjoy that. They have a lot of applicable information in that publication. Excellent. And I would agree with Cattle Facts. Yeah, I think that's just, again, industry knowledge of um, prices and, and, and so forth is, is um, you know, great to be on top of knowing the markets, right? I guess the other one is less less on the professional side. Is there is there any uh, book or documentary you have uh, read or watched lately that's not necessarily ag beef related that gave you some insight into either communicating with colleagues, communicating with customers, or just something of interest? <laughs> Sure. I'm trying to remember the name of the book I just read. Um, there was there is a documentary on Netflix. So you put me on the spot to remember the name of it. I think it was on Netflix and there is a book about it. And it's about sustainability um, of ruminants specifically. Um, and it talks a lot about uh, just the different production systems that are around the world. Um and the sustainability associated with them. And then it's not always what we think um, or what we're told maybe. Is the slant towards support of animal ag or, 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 or not? I would say it was really balanced. Um, oh, okay. It does call, 
it, it was I thought it was very fair and balanced. It um, called out the things that maybe we need to work on, but it also called out the things that we do correctly or the things that sometimes are spun not in our light. Okay. That's yeah. great to hear that it's that it that it's balanced because so many I, I actually enjoy watching uh, t- there tends to be more of the other end, you know, bashing the industry, but I I I think it's really important we watch those or read those because we need to be aware of what's out there to counter that, right? So many times you know, you're traveling to NCBA and you're on a flight or in the airport and you start chatting with someone and you tell them you're from the beef industry and you probably get the whole range of, uh, oh, I'm a beef producer also, or, oh, uh, you know, how can you eat beef or, you know, or my family and I are deciding should we stop eating beef? And I think, you know, it's maybe only one person or one family, but that's where we have our opportunity to counter some of the uh, myths or, or false information and, or at least bring people up to, uh, saying, Hey, investigate this a little further. You know, if you want to become vegetarian, that's fine, but Mm -hmm. at least read this or consider this before you make that decision. The name of it is sacred cow. I could (laughs) went blank on that sacred Sacred cow. cow. Okay. There is a documentary about it, but there is also a book. It was based on a book. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yep. I just, uh, the case for better meat. Um, I just mm-hmm. I just Googled that. So that's great. Okay. So the sacred cow. For those of you out there, uh, dairy or beef, uh, sounds like a, a good uh, good listen um, or watch as, as a documentary. Amy, I, I guess our last uh, kind of wrap up common question is um, within beef, dairy, within the ag industry, uh, what sets aside those innovative progressive producers that are going to have lo- longevity in the in the market uh, compared to those that you know are maybe not still with us or, or won't be with us much longer sure yeah just the willingness to be progressive and to explore doing things differently than they were done by your father or your grandfather we hear often when we are out we may hear well we've always done it that way those can be dangerous words, right? So yes. exploring different ways to do things, um, even if it's out of your comfort zone. Now you have to do that wisely because not all advice given to you is good advice, but just the willingness to be progressive and do things maybe differently than than you have in the past. Great. No, I, re- I really like that. Uh, you know, think outside of the box. Uh, maybe you don't have to be the uh, initial adopter, but an early adopter, mm-hmm. right? And, and and at least be willing to think, uh, you know, I, I like you said, uh, always doing it like dad or grandpa did could be great or could also be the, the end of the operation. Mm-hmm. Well, Amy, it's been a, a pleasure to have you uh, with us this morning uh, and uh, connecting here first thing in the morning. Uh, looking forward to uh, potentially meeting you at, 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 in some professional meeting here in the near future. Uh, best of success with the the innovation program with the the link between dairy and beef with Cargill. I think that's really exciting and Mm -hmm. uh, a great opportunity for on our side for our dairy producers and obviously on the on the beef side for the industry you know creating a better better end animal for for the beef market. So as we wrap up here uh, thanks to all the listeners. Uh, Thank you Dr. Amy Hafe. And uh, we'll uh, be in touch uh, on an upcoming podcast. Thank you.